Actually, my name is Scott. I have been working at the Rep for 20 years. I became the charge artist 18 years ago. I've been painting scenery at the Muni and Opera Theater for 27 years. I am the charge scenic artist for Variety Children's Theater. I am also on the National Executive Board for United Scenic Artists Local 829, which is the union that represents all the set designers, sound designers, lighting designers, costume designers, video projection designers, and scenic artists. Um, we're the ones, uh, uh, and literally all across the country, we're, we're a, a national organization. If, um, when you're seeing these guys up on stage coll uh, collecting their Tony Awards, that's, that's usually us. That's, uh, we're, we're a big group. Um, we've got about 4,500 members spread out across the country. It's a, it's a, it's a big, big organization. Um, today we're going to just talk about basically the design process. And I brought some samples along. I'll confess they're not my designs, but I figure, has, has anybody up here seen Evita upstairs on the main stage? Have you seen it? So I, I, I brought a lot of the designs for that that we executed. So you can be able to go up and see how it goes from the paper that we get to the actual um, thing upstairs. So if you have a chance, stick your head in upstairs and see some of the stuff. We're all very proud of it. That was done by a designer who came out of New York, a man named Luke Cantarella, who's done several things for us here at the Rep in, in past years. Um, but let me talk about how we get to the whole process that we go through. I want to clear up a couple of misconceptions about the design process as well. Um, like I said, I am primarily a painter, but I also design things from a range of the Rep's Imaginary Theater Company, which is four actors and a stage manager and a van that take a small set and they set it up in schools and they do a 45 minute performance and they break it all down and put it back in the van and they drive to the next school and do it again. So that's very small children's theater. And I also do uh, Grand Opera for um, Winter Opera St. Louis. Um, we've got a production of the Flader Mouse coming up in about a month. Um, so there are definitely design challenges that are completely different between tiny little, little uh, children's theater versus Grand Opera that just requires enormous amounts of scenery to fill a huge stage. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the things along the process, but I'm also going to share maybe a couple of stories about some of the things that can and, and have gone wrong for us in, in, in the past. I'm going to refer to my notes a little bit so I can stay on track. And if, there's a, if I say something that raises a question, you know, let, um, just, just shout the question out. Let's, let, let's keep it real, real, real simple. Um, what does the designer do? Um, I'm going to put this in kind of terms that other people, because I, I think on a lot of smaller theaters, if you're a, a high school theater teacher, for example, you're probably wearing every single hat. You're the director, you're the designer, you're the lighting designer, you're the costume designer, you do everything. But in, in this sort of professional world, um, everybody's got their own little job. And in the case of theater, the designer is kind of like the architect of the house. You wouldn't expect your architect to pick up a hammer and actually build your house, would you? Um, but a lot of people expect the designers to actually work on their own shows. Um, and we try to discourage that. And a lot of times it's, it's just because of, of a, it's, it's kind of a money and unfair thing. If you're, if you're contracted to do the show and see the show through to the end, there's no limit to the number of hours the theater can force you to work. And, and we kind of don't want that. We prefer it to have the separate crews doing their jobs um, and, and making the money along the way. So um, if, the, if the designer is like the architect, I'm going to say that the, the director is kind of like the homeowner. The, d the designers are working towards fulfilling the dreams and the, the vision of the director. And the director then has their whole set of, of design team underneath them. Um, the technical director would then be kind of considered the, um, the general contractor, who would then actually be like the engineer to figure out how to make this thing work and structural and not fall down. And then you've got all the carpenters and painters underneath them. So the designer has two jobs. The designer has to come up with the ideas for what the show is going to look like and then communicate the ideas to the people who are going to actually execute the work. So I'll start a little bit first about the, the, the idea aspect of it. Um, I think when you're, when you're starting to come up with the ideas, the first thing you do is you have to meet with the director. I, I had a situation with um, one of my, my coworkers who was designing a show for a high school. And they came up to him one day and they said, so, well, we, we need a shelf on this wall because it says in the script that, that 
that you're supposed to go over to the shelf and get a coffee cup off the shelf. It was part of the play. And he said, well, how was I supposed to know that? What do you expect me to do, read the script? And I was like, well, yes, that is, that is exactly what you do. The first thing you do is, in, in my process, first thing I'll do is either read the script or the libretto, and you just read it straight through just to get a feel for the overall thing. And then you put it away for a day. And you, and you just kind of let that mull over for, for a while. Then you pick it up again. And then you go back through, and if you're allowed to, sometimes you're not allowed to mark up your scripts, but if you're allowed to, then you go through with a highlighter. And every time it mentions, oh, coffee cup, we need to, and then you write it down on a list so you can hand it over to the props person. The set designer, by the way, also does, not only designs the walls and the set, but they also design the props and the furniture. That's all, that's all considered part of the, of the design process for the set designer. So um, you've, you've made all your markings. You've got your whole list together. And then you start kind of going through. Then you've got to start doing the research. You know, then you, and this is where the, the internet has made things so much easier for everybody to just do a quick Google search of whatever you're looking for. Um, first thing that you're going to have to do is, is make sure that uh, history is, is on your side. Um, I did a production last year of um, Donizetti's Elixir of Love. And the director decided she wanted to set it on the hill in St. Louis in 1940. Did anybody happen to see that? You saw it? Uh, it was a fun, fun show. And, and so often, let's face it, when you, when you take the, the, the opera was originally written to be in the 1500s in a small Italian village. Well, you know, we've kind of got a small Italian village. It's not 1500, but it's a small Italian village. And sometimes, you know, a director will, will get this concept of, oh, let's, let's, set, let's set Coriolanus in Nazi Germany in 1940. Um, and it works for one scene in the show, and the rest of the show <laughs> suffers. You know what I mean? So I think this one worked all the way. It worked all the way through. So it was a, it was a really great concept. But you have to do the research, and this is something that I still, you know, I don't know how if I wanted to fight it anymore. I was asked to make two of these little uh, shops on the street. One of them to be Volpe's, and one of them to be Di Gregorio's. And in the review. I got criticized because Di Gregorio's was, that did not come around until 1978. Well, my hands were tied because Di Gregorio's was a, a sponsor of the show. And I was for, it's like, but Di Gregorio's is not accurate. Say, oh, no one will notice. Well, someone noticed. So, so uh, you know, I, I don't, it, it doesn't really matter. But, you know, there is always going to be someone, someone like my father who watches a World War II movie and says, oh, this movie is stupid. Those are the wrong kind of tires on that bus. You know, he, some, someone will always notice the, the, the little thing, that one little thing that, that you didn't. So you have to do your research and you have to take notes. Then you've got to meet with the director to make sure that you're seeing this thing this, this, the same way. And it's usually like, what do you think about this? No, that doesn't work. So you go back and you draw it again. And how about this? No, 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 take it back and draw it, draw it again. And you finally come up with the same thing. Now you've got to start having production meetings. You've got to start talking with all of the different designers. Because we've had horrible situations, and I'll, and I'll get to just some of the uh, physical examples in just a minute, where the set designer and the costume designer were not communicating very well, and an actress walked out on stage wearing a dress that was the exact same color as the wall that she was standing in front of. <laughs> so uh, she looked like a floating head. That's, really, that's, that's, that's all you could really see. And um, consequently, as the painter, it, it, it hit close to home, really, it, it really hurt. Because in the grand scheme of things, what do you think is easier, building a new costume or repainting the wall? So, so, so guess who had to fix it? So designers, is there any you know, designers in the room? No? Um, um, if the painters make a mistake, the painters have to fix it. If the designer makes a mistake, the painters have to fix it. <laughs> So, so uh, you know, uh, the painters are are our friends. We have to we have to be uh, keep on good terms with them. Um, all right. So, so we've we've got the concept. The other thing that I really wanted to stress, and I think the thing that is most important, you you get into the history of things. You do research. You want to make sure that things are accurate in style. Um, you know, the director may decide we want to set this in like the Art Deco era. So there's and that has a, a specific feel. The other thing that is the, probably the most difficult thing is color. And, and the color aspect of it, um, when you go upstairs and look at Evita, one of the most critical things that we had, we had 
several hour long discussions over the shade of blue. Because everybody, if I just mentioned blue, everybody's got probably a, 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 a picture in their mind of what blue is. But they're probably all slightly different, different blues. Um, it was critical in the director's eye that we make sure that we do find some shade of blue that correlates to and works with and complements the shade of blue that's in the Argentinian flag. Because that you can't change. So there are certain things that are, that are just set in stone and, you, and you, have to, you have to go with. The other thing you might want to also look at, sometimes a great place to start for inspiration is to find an artist that you like. Um, you may decide, and some people say like, uh, oh, this should, whole thing should be set, should be painted in the style of, of uh, Gustav Klimt or Picasso or either an artist or an art movement. Because a lot of times those are, are like really good places to start. And, and what you see here in front of you, these are all samples that we've done at the rep. Because it's a very visual medium, we cannot do it in words. We have to have meetings face to face. Even when you're sending emails and things like that, you're looking at pictures, everybody's computer screen is slightly different. So you have to be looking at the same thing. Um, we've done these samples because when a director or designer says, we want a brick wall here, I've got three or four different samples of brick. And that way, someone can look at it and say, oh, no, no, this is too dark, this is too red, this is, it's, it's too something. But it, it's a starting point. You can't, you, you can't start with a concept. You have to start with something physical when you do something like that. Yes, question. Well, then speaking of uh, starting points, with a show that's already kind of famous, like Ita, mm -hmm. and um, you know you're going to have to have a balcony, do you copy, or, or in any case, or is, is the regional theater obligated to sort of copy the original New York production, or how does that work? No, um, and actually it, it brings up an interesting, that um, some of the, of the designs are actually kind of, I don't know what to say, patented, you know, under a, um, yeah. um, uh, it's, it's proprietary. You, yeah. um, designers have been sued for stealing other people's concepts and designs. But yes, you ha you're right, you have to have a balcony. Um, and depending on, on how big the theater is, um, you know, most designers are, are they, they come up with their own designs. You, can't, you cannot like say, oh, well, I had a balcony in mind, so you can't have a balcony in yours. That's my intellectual property. I own that concept. Because balcony is, you know, you don't own, own the whole term balcony. So you but get in trouble but for, for too closely copying the original? Some, some designers have. There have, there have been lawsuits. We've, we've had to arbitrate lawsuits over, over uh, intellectual property. Okay. Um, but it's, it's, it's pretty broad, pretty vague. It, it, it happens very, very rarely. Very rarely. I mean, it seems like you'd want to put your own, you and the director would want to. Right. Well, it's, it. it's, it's kind of like, you know, we, we in, invest several tens of thousands of dollars in these sets, and they all end up in the dumpster. Um, and a lot of you, no one wants to use that someone else's set. Uh, you know, they, they, they all have their own, every show has their own specific needs. Um, you can rehash pieces of, of things, but a lot of times it's actually more work yeah. to, to, to um, reuse something than it is to start, start fresh, which, and more work means more money. Because that's the other thing that we're do, dealing with. The designer is stuck in the middle between the director who wants everything and the technical director who has no money to spend on anything. So there's always, you know, the, the budget is always the biggest battle for, for anything, for anything. Everybody always wants more. No one ever says, no, this is too much. Take some of it away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just real briefly, I also want to explain there are different types of sets that you may have encountered over the past. There's, um, some directors are very literal. And, and if, it says, if it says there's a balcony in the show, then there has to be a balcony. If it says, if it says there's a refrigerator in the show, you know, the, the, um, Things, some directors will be very literal, and others can be open up to more of an abstract idea. Um, but the, the literal interpretation, we have either single sets, which means the whole play takes place in one room or in one building. There are multi-sets where, you know, I've, I, I did a production of uh, Il Trovatore a couple years ago, and there are literally eight different locations. It's done in four acts, and each act has two different locations. Um, and if you bring in an, a, a complete new set for every single thing, it's, it, it's a multi-set. But the thing that's happening more often than now that you'll notice more often is what we call a unit set, which is kind of a more abstract thing. A lot of them is just a lot of platforms 
and, and abstract walls, and, and they change a lot of things with projections. And so um, they're all on different scales. Quite frankly, a single set pays the least, multi set pays the most, unit set pays somewhere in the middle. And we've actually had a lot of arbitration in, in the union where producers want to pay someone for a single set. No, that's not a single set. That's a, that's a unit set with phases. And um, it's, it's a different pay scale for those, for those things. So the, um, but what about Michael Shaw, the human you know, I would consider that a single set because it was only, it really only happened in two rooms. They were two rooms, the, the rooms never changed. They were never anything other than the rooms. And I think that's where, you know, like if, if you're in that house in, a, in, in the room and then suddenly somebody has like a, a, they come to a downstage corner and they have a flashback of when they were on vacation in Hawaii and the, and the lighting changes, then that suddenly turns it into a unit set because, because it's suddenly that play has gone to a different location. But if the whole thing takes place in the same place and it never, never leaves that, that space. Do you have a preference or think one looks better than the other? It, 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 the, 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 the script determines everything. Yeah. The script determines everything. Um, we've had some, well, I'll, I'll get into some of those things. I hope I have some time in a minute. Um, maybe I should start talking a little bit about some of the, the, the process. So communicating the ideas. We start with communicating to the technical director who is the engineer and the, the contractor that has to build this thing. Um, a lot of the stuff out there is all made out of aluminum because the, there's an upper level that has to be structural enough for people to walk on. So you can't build it in a way that, that, that's unsafe. So we started with this. This was the first drawing that we got that just represents the layout of the floor with all the tiles. Um, and these are, these are draftings, they're, they're black and white line drawings. I drew the pink on there with the highlighter because that's the turntable, that, that part moves. So, so I, had to, I wanted to get that uh, its own, its own just, just to keep it clear because you can see some of these. The, the, the black lines in here represent a mortar thickness of a half inch mortar line, but the red lines are just, these are all supposed to look like inlaid marble. So, so there's no mortar in the red lines, that's just two different pieces of marble that go next to each other. And actually this is kind of, this is the sample that we made for the floor to show what the floor looked like. And this is the shade of blue that we started with. It was too blue. We had to mute it back because this, this was a little too, a little too warm for the, for the Argentinian flag. It needed to be a little bit greener. So, so um, but we could start that discussion. All right, then we started getting all of the drawings of, this was the, the breakup of the, of the wall. Um, on the Avita wall. Again, this was not quite right either. This is too green now. So we had, the, the blue was the biggest thorn in our side. We had more discussions about that shade of blue than, you, than anybody would want to. Um, this was the elevation for the, the, the backdrop that's above the upper level. So uh, we, had, we painted this on muslin out at our paint shop. Here we have now, this is, this is what we refer to as a paint elevation, as opposed to like a drafting. So these are the drawings that are given to the painters then. It's a different set of drawings that are given to us um, so that we know exactly what to paint to, to match the colors. The colors on this one were pretty good, pretty close. So, so we, were, we were good to go on this one. But you can see there's the mortar lines in there, but there's no mortar in any of this, this marble area up here. Um, these are all painted on sheets of, of like this stuff, of like masonite or MDF, and that's all laid down, and those are, that's painted directly on the floor. So, now, down here in the studio, we have to paint directly on the floor itself because um, it's a fire marshal thing. You can't have any levels up for people to have emergency exits, so we have to paint. All right, here's, here's what the, the, the entire drafting packet for the show that the designer, um, Luke Cantarella, produced along with my notes in red on the side. So these are all the walls. I mean, you can see there are 12 pages of, of drawings here. Let's see if I can get to some of them. No, I think I just get, just, so, so there are some examples here of, of just the, the full scale of all the different moldings that we had to create for the, for the inside. Um, every single wall, every single detail has its own drafting because these are, these are how the designer communicates with the technical director to, for what to build. I and mean, here you can see the, the shape of the balcony bump out on the upper level. How long between your first meeting and opening that? Um, it yeah, 
the question, yeah, the question was how long from the first meeting until opening night? Um, I would say a lot of times directors and designers will start talking original concepts between six months and a year before the show. Um, beca because uh, designers are usually paid on a single fee. It's, 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 and it's based on, is it a single set? Is it a multi-set? Is it a, is it a, a unit set? So, so as how, how much work goes into it, and designers are working on several shows at a time. They're, they're never working on one show at a time. They'll, a lot of designers are 20, 25 shows a year. So they're always sitting out in the house on their computer working on their next show. Did you yeah. say which type of set of you to that's, that's definitely a unit set with phases, because all the different locations came out on the turntable. They're going into the bedroom. They're going into the nightclubs. They're going into the, yeah, so it's definitely a unit set. But the, the, the physical walls never changed. So yeah. but that's, but that's it, right? So who came up with the idea of the doors? Um, that's, that's probably, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to guess, because I wasn't in those meetings, but I'm going to guess the director. Um, the director, Rob Ruggiero, is probably one of the most specific people I've ever met. He knows exactly what he wants. And, and, and when you can please him, you have really succeeded in something, because he's. Are there lots of different contests and styles, like Timothy Nguyen is coming up, she's been here many times. Mm -hmm. that, are you more used to working with her? Or? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's definitely everybody has their own different style of directing, and they all have their different. Everybody has their own aesthetic of what they what they like to see, what they what they you know. Some people just like a really bare open stage, so the actors have free range to move over it, and others lo just love a, a detail, every single inch. Um, yeah, it, so it, it really depends on um, directors and designers. A lot of times have kind of a, a, a relationship together where a director has designers that they like and they bring them with them as their team all the way along the process. Um, and finally, what I want to I want to oh, let me also show you. these were also things that were given to the painters. Um, these were just research photos of this is the style of wood that we were looking at for Chase platform. This is kind of this hammered gold finish on the on the balcony. These are just um, the 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 level of the peeling paint on the, the platforming on the side. So this is just the sort of research. It's not, this is not exactly what we did on the show, but this was just to get the, the right feel. And so from these, I was able to generate these samples for the show, like for the, for the mirrors, you know, to, to, to age and distress and dirty up the mirrors and to, you know, where was this? This is what we were given, and so this is kind of what we created to see. So, and then we, Yeah, but 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 yeah, again, this was you know just just the, the the just the the general idea versus what we what we. Um, during the actors' talk after one of the performances that we ushered, um, somebody asked about whose idea and what did it mean the piles of chairs on each side of the stage. So we came up with that. Yeah. and What did it mean? They didn't quite know. Yeah, I mean, I don't know either. I, 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 I don't, it's a it's a mystery. Yeah, a, yeah well, I, I do know one of the concepts, kind of there was a horizontal break, and everything above the line of the balcony was beautiful gilded gold, and everything below it was was the the, the gritty, dirty Argentina. And they were chaotic. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So. So, so that's kind of you know where that was you know the, that elevation of and and the, the the separation of of the pristine the upper class versus the yeah. versus the lower, yeah. and so that's so that's a lot of where that came from. Um, so finally, what I also want to want to talk about in this design process here is I have a couple of drawings. These were done by by Duncy Dye, who's on faculty here, um, for a Variety Children's Program uh, for Mary Poppins. And this was the painter's elevation. This is what I was given to paint for a scene of London for, for Mary Poppins. Oh, wow. um, and then this in the, in the concept. And then this is just the steps um, of the cathedral where the woman sells the, the bird seed, right? These are painter's elevations. He will then put them together into a rendering. And, and the renderings are kind of a composite look of what his vision is of what the show will look like fully dressed out with all the scenic elements in place and the lighting effects in place. You kind of notice the biggest thing, now we talked about color of blue. What do you notice about the color of blue, right? 
right? So, so this is his vision of, he thinks that it's going to have kind of a warm purple light on it, which will affect all of this. But this is what I'm supposed to paint. And then all the other things are done with lighting effects. Um, so this is where it gets very confusing and where you have to be very clear because I'm going to tell you another little horror story of, of, of one of the things that happened. We did a show, and the sample that we were given was the whole set was supposed to be painted to look like white marble. But the rest of the, the lighting designer and the costume designer and the director had been given renderings, not paint elevations. And the rendering showed orange light coming from this direction and blue light coming from here. And so when they set the setup, the lighting designer said, where's all the orange and blue? He said, oh, well, that's supposed to be you. I just didn't. And, and uh, so the lighting designer had not planned for any of it. He didn't have any colors in any of his gel gels up for the. Um, and, and consequently, the set was all way too light. So we ended up having to spray the whole thing down and make the whole set a whole lot darker. Because there was that, that, that it's, it's a very easy confusion. People tend to use the words rendering when they mean elevation. And so it's really, really difficult and really have to be very, very clear um, of what it is that you're looking at when you get these drawings. Um, I want to share like, some, of the, some of the biggest challenges that we were How are we doing on time? Five more minutes, OK. Some of the biggest challenges that, that, that we faced, um, it, and it all goes back to the script. One year for um, Imaginary Theater Company, we did a little show called A Gnome for Christmas. And it, was, it dealt with a magical gnome who, who changes this family's lives. Well, it was a magic show. I mean, I've never designed a magic trick. And there's all this magic written in the, you know, it's, it says that the gnome is supposed to take these, these curtains that are stained with blueberry juice and put them in his hat and pull out uh, clean curtains. Like, how do you do that? So we figured that out. But the, 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 the bigger trick was it described this invention that this guy had made. And it describes that he has this, this, this backpack thing. This is, it's a, it's a, a, a log splitter. And he, it's, it describes the action as this. They pick up a log, and they put it in the box, and they pull a lever, and kindling falls out the other side. And they say, hey, that was neat. Do that again. <laughs> so they have to pick up another log, put it in, in the box, pull the switch, and more kindling falls out. Now the, the gnome comes over and waves his magic wand over the box. The third time, they put a log in the box, pull a switch, and wooden toys come out. <laughs> okay. and, and I was like, how? I mean, we, we had meeting after meeting. And, 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 and we finally did figure it out. We, we, we got it. And it was, it was, it was brilliant. It was, it was fantastic. It worked so well. And it, it was the lowest tech, simplest thing you could ever think of. Do you want me to tell you how we did it? Yes. Each log was slightly smaller than the one before. And the kindling was inside the log. So the actors had to pick up the log like this on both ends so you couldn't see it was hollow on both ends. And they'd shove it in the hole. When they pulled the lever, it tipped the log. And everything that was inside the log tipped out. And then they reset it. And they put the second log in, and it fit inside the first log. And they oh, so and and. And we, I mean, we literally had to tell everybody how we did it because, because I mean, you really couldn't figure out how it was done. They, and the actors did a great job of making sure they picked everything up. So, so that was really brilliant. Um, that was called A Gnome for Christmas. And it was, it was uh, it, it's, it's one of my favorite shows that we've done. Because sometimes those things, you read it and you just, how the heck are we going to do that? And, and when you find, when you figure it out, when you finally figure it out, you know it, you really you really are proud of it at the end. I mean, it, sometimes, and you ask the direct, the, the the writers and the and the director, like, do you ever you know when you write this stuff, do you, do you are you have some idea? Oh no no, if I ever, if I thought about how you were going to do it, I would it would just stifle my creativity. I'd never come up with anything. So so they really don't care. Um, I also last year did um, an opera that was done at Washington University, called Borgia Infamy. It was one of the biggest nightmares we've ever, ever had to do. The, hour, the, the opera itself was only an hour and 45 minutes long. But it had over 17 scenes in it. And, and, and it's literally, it was an issue that we have in theater now is I think people have started watching too many movies. And they write movie scripts and say, here, put this on stage. You know, it was described that at one point, the cardinal picks his, takes his hat off and throws it in the air. And it describes the hat lands in. Um, the, the cardinal throws his hat in the air in Venice, 
and it lands in Rome in the, in the circle of, of small children who pick up the hat and proceed to sing a, a song mocking the cardinal, and then they jump back to the Vatican Museum um, present day. Uh, so this, this, this opera jumps back and forth, not only between Rome and Venice and Florence, but it also jumps back and forth between 1500 and present day. And, and we had to do it really all with, with, with lighting. We did a lot of scrim work. But it was, it was just an absolute, like, how, it's, you, suddenly you read these things and you just say, this is just, it just isn't possible, it isn't possible. And then you kind of just like the, you know, kind of na narrow down, chisel away at the problems and they kind of start to come together. We make the impossible possible. We make the possible possible. <laughs> it didn't make the opera any better. But it, <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the music was unlistenable and the libretto was nonsense, but, oh but it looked good. <laughs> I guarantee, if you missed it, you'll probably never see it again, because they'll never do it again. They, they got a, a grant, a, a man who was um, on music faculty at Washington University um, wrote the opera, and he passed away several years ago, and his nephew um, wanted to see his uncle's opera perform, so he put up the money to, to have it done, but it'll probably never be done again. <laughs> a winter opera. Winter opera. Winter opera. So um, we're getting out of that. Did anybody have any questions? Or, If you're, if, you're, if you're staying in, that ne next session I'm going to go talk through, I'm going to go through all these samples and show you how we, how we make those, those magical things happen, how we, how we turn everyday items into, uh, into things that you wouldn't believe are actually made out of what they're made out of.